What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Burn Pit Podcast. I am your host, Scott Benjamin Sievers. To my right is Matt McCook, Matty Wack. What's up, brother? What's up, brother? You're watching us live on the Spreely Network. It's 4 o'clock. It's Monday, January 15th. And Spreely is your free speech platform. It stands for Speak Freely. You can download Spreely, Roku, Apple TV. If you have Fire Stick, you can find it there. You can also go on your phone or smart device and download it right from the App Store. It's called the Freedom Hub. It's Freedom Hub. It's free. It supports uh, podcasts just, uh, just like this one. And uh, it, it helps out. Uh, the Spreelys are great. They've been really good to us. Yeah. But here we are. Monday, January 15th. It's January 15th, best day of the week. Why don't we um, get right into yes. it? We have a Here guest we today. We do have a guest today. Our guest today is a previous previous guest who's on episode number 35. Matt was the host. Uh, he is a former Marine. He was a gunnery sergeant, and he was also the former director of studies at the United States Army War College Strategic Studies Institute, where he held the position of the Douglas MacArthur Chair of Research. Uh, he received the Superior Civilian Service Award in 1998. Uh, he has taught at the United States Military Academy at West Point, Georgetown, the uh, University of Pennsylvania, and John Hopkins University School of Advanced Internal Studies. His resume is unbelievable. Uh, we want to thank him again for coming on and thank him for his time. Dr. Alan Zabrowski, sir, how are you? I'm doing very well. I'll make it Alan, please. Yes, sir. Okay. We'll do Alan. Yeah, Alan, good to see you. Now, if I'm not mistaken... Because I want to add a little bit more to that. You write for Veterans Today, is that correct? Uh, for Veterans Today, I write for a number of other places, yes. I'm on the Oons. editorial board of Veterans Today. Okay, you're on, Okay, and Oons Review? or And Oons Review also. Okay, yes. cool. Because I want people to, if they want to uh, look for any of your uh, material, I want them to go to those two platforms and look at your material and read them. Because you're you're excellent writer on your articles, I know that, uh, just on, on a personal level. But... I'm sorry. Go ahead, Scotty. We're going to jump right into it. Sure. I mean, uh, what, uh, a day like today, we have to start off with the news of the day, and it is Martin Luther King Day. Really? <laughs> I thought it was uh, Stonewall Jackson's now, birthday. <laughs> now, what we do here, what we do here at the Burn Pit, Maddie, we're trying to build a reputation of giving you the whole, the the the, the hard facts. Yes. Right. The truth. Yes. We are truth seekers, and not only are we truth seekers, but we're, we're trying to lift the veil, so to yes. speak. So, yes. uh, our guest, I'm curious to, to see, uh, Alan, wh what your take is on MLK and his legacy. Well, I, I actually heard his speech on the radio, on the wall, when he is, I have a dream speech. You know, and I think one of those iconic phrases which have uh, resonated down through the years and I'll paraphrase because I do not remember it exactly. I was a young Marine then and more concerned with cleaning my rifle than listening to the radio. That's to keep my then gunnery sergeant off my back. <laughs> um, but it was basically that, that he had a dream and one of those dreams that he dreamed of a day when his children would be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skins. Martin Luther King would not be part of any black movement today in this country. He and I, because I was supporting civil rights in those days, very strongly supporting it, as it was defined in those days, uh, which is a combination of rights and responsibilities, never would have believed that black America would have become the cesspool that it is today. And I think if Martin Luther King were to look out at the world, uh, because he was very smart, he was very wise, I think in a number of ways, he would not only be disappointed with the leadership of black America today, with the BLM, with Al Sharpton, uh, with the members of Congress who are black. I think he would reverse that and he would say he has a dream where his children would be judged by the color of their skin, not the content of their character. Because what I see, and I have lived in a black majority city in a black majority neighborhood for almost 30 years down here in Mississippi. I'm originally from Michigan. Uh, and I see black America day in and day out, and I see what it is. And I think if you look at it and look at the fact that there are no safe and well-governed black majority neighborhoods, schools, cities, or countries in the world, period, 
you would have to take a look and say, why did Martin Luther King's dream go astray? Because none of us thought it would in the early 60s. We really believed, really believed that if we simply took down the legal barriers that it might take a generation or so because it took a generation or so for most of our ancestors who immigrated to this country to start to fit in. You know, it's just not an instant thing, shake and bake. Uh, but it went astray. I mean, there's lots of reasons we can say why, there's lots of explanations, there's lots of excuses, but the reality is either something went horribly wrong in the development and the evolution of the civil rights movement, or they were judged by the content of their character all along, which is even more depressing. So you have your choice between bad and worse. And I think, but I, I do think that King himself would be appalled at the state of the black leadership today, where their only, their only recourse, their first, last, and only recourse to any question, any issue, is to shriek racism. They have nothing else. And try and do separation and segregation to get them away from competition, not just from whites, but from Asians who do better than whites in almost every measure, and Hispanics who do a little bit worse, but better than blacks. They don't want comparison. And King's view was that given the proper opportunities, they could compete, and it didn't happen. I think he would be depressed. I think he would be terribly depressed and terribly disappointed, and he would immediately be criticized by every single prominent black leader today with a few of, exception of a few who might be Republicans, as an Uncle Tom and no longer part of the civil rights movement. They like his legacy, they like his statue, they like his vacation, they like his holiday, but they don't like what he said because they can't walk the walk and they aren't doing it. Matt? Yeah. Um, uh, listen. I don't want you to hold back here. All right. I don't want you to hold now, back. Now if you want to hear what I really think. Well, yeah. Matt, no. Matt, would you like to interject well, and just give your opinion? Yeah, real quick, because I don't want to. I don't want to stay on this subject too long. But um, just from knowing all the facts about him, he associated uh, with communists uh, a lot, including Barry Levinson, who was the treasury for the uh, Communist Party USA, multiple other communist organizations. He Barry Levinson, treasurer for the Communist Party USA. He. Uh, even had FBI files and tapes that the FBI has tapes on him where they have at least 40 instances where he cheated on his wife, Coretta. Apparently, Coretta knew about it. She didn't really care. Uh, he, he, You couldn't even call him a Christian. Now, this is my take. There's black leaders all across this country that will tell you the same thing. So this isn't just like my take. It's like some sort of racist take. This is uh, 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 MLK was a complete degenerate alcohol. He got uh, hotel rooms with hookers doing drugs. Again, this is all documented on, on FBI uh, tapes. Um, multiple different communist organizations that he dealt with. He, did, he plagiarized a lot of his um, works. Uh, to get uh, uh, into certain organizations. Again, it's all documented. I actually shared a video today, a documentary that documents all of this. Uh, I will be sharing another one later tonight on my IG page. Um, in my opinion, he was a complete degenerate. I don't think he gets any credit for anything. I don't like him. I mean, maybe what he said he believed in, to Dr. Sobrowski's point, to Alan's point, you know, I can agree with what he talked about, but as a person, um, I think he just did it for political gain. And he, in my opinion, is a complete degenerate. And that's that's the bottom line. Well, without spending too at much a, time on a it, personal it, level, if we're talking about personalities, I'm yeah. not going to disagree with you in the slightest. I think okay. that there is, in most of our cases, in most of the people we look at and we consider our heroes, there is an enormous disconnect between their public persona and their private. People think of John Kennedy compared to the people that we have in office today. You know, do for you, don't ask what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. We are the watchmen on the walls of world freedom. He, I don't think he was a great president, but he was a lot better than a lot of the ones we've had since. But in his private life, in his private life, it was a very different thing. Always, always, if you look at an individual, there is a strong disconnect between their public persona and their private. It would be nice to think that there weren't, but there, 
but there is. And I don't, but take anyone you want, Republican or Democrat, either side of the spectrum, there are damn few whose private lives will live up to the standards they set in their public discourse. I would agree. Very few. I would Very agree few. with that. I just think his uh, purpose and use, in my opinion, if you look at a lot of the civil rights laws, a lot of them, you'll agree with me, unconstitutional a lot of them. Right. I mean, a lot of these civil rights laws are unconstitutional. And I think, you know, I, I think he was just used by cultural Marxists to push that agenda further. Um, again, I'm not saying that, you know, there's some, you know, virtue in, in, in what he said. But I believe he was used by Marxist communists within the 60s to push that cultural Marxism even further. I, I, that's just my opinion, yep. Special, especially when it comes to some of the civil rights laws that are unconstitutional. Well, there, there really wasn't cultural Marxism in the early 60s. It really got, there was a regular Marxism, a regular Communist Party, of course there was. It was declared illegal in 1954. But that didn't really have any, any traction, either in academics or even in the media. If you take a look at the media in the 1960s and compare it to that of the media of today, there's a fair difference on it. Yeah. Um, but I, I think you know and that one of the things that, um, that's intriguing to me, just as answering for a little parallel, uh, he plagiarized his PhD dissertation just as the late president of Harvard did. <laughs> yeah. But the difference is that when it came out, and I think it was sometime in the late 1970s or early 1980s, you know, before you guys were born, you were just dreams on the, on the frontiers there. Uh, when the, per the person was still alive whose dissertation he had plagiarized, and he said he was proud to have helped Dr. King get ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting yeah. way to go on it. Uh, well, we can move on from this subject. Sure. Go ahead. No, we got. no problem. Well, there is one thing, uh, you know, if, if people watch and listen to this or, or going to view it in the future, um, if you look, even if you go and Google uh, Alan Zabrowski and you go, there's a Wikipedia page <laughs> that's been done. But if you really do, if you look at your, uh, Alan Zabrowski's resume, when it comes to education, uh, especially being a Marine, because we're Marines are known as, uh, you know, rocks here. We're yep, jarheads, yep. right? Knuckle draggers. Uh, you're, you're knuckle draggers. <laughs> we're crayon. We're crayon eaters. Uh, you know, you're either a rock or a rocket scientist. And Alan Zabrowski is a rocket scientist. Okay. Uh, his, uh, his, the work he's done in the education field is uh, uh, astounding. But one of the things I wanted to get personally wanted to get a uh, yep. question on was. His publications have mainly focused on alliance systems and unionizations in the United States military. If you wouldn't mind taking a little bit, or as whatever time you'd like, if you could explain the, uh, why y you would support unionization in the military. I wouldn't. And in you fact, would not? Okay. And in fact, I, I, I don't support that. I think that unionization, that public sector unions, as opposed to private sector unions, um, are a horrible idea. I mean... I'm, I'm completely in favor of an open shop system where if the unions want to compete in the private sector with non-unions workplaces, and if they can give the workers a better job than the workers can get without unions, that's a different issue. But for the military, for any public sector, police, fire department, I don't care what you wish. I think a union is a terrible idea. There are a half a dozen countries that have tried military unions. None of them have enjoyed it except the old West Germany. And in West Germany's case, they had two major military unions, and they had retired officers heading each one of them. That took care of it. Basically, they were, they were house unions in which they had them, but they really didn't matter. They weren't unions in the sense of going on strike. I never heard of a German armored division going on strike for better wages. Right. Yeah, no, me neither. That, that would have been sort of it. But I, I mean, the whole idea that people who are paid at the public trough and have public service to do should have the right to strike or do any kind of job actions and thereby jeopardize public safety and national security in the case of the unions. If they don't have a, have, it's horrible. If they, if they don't have the right to strike, they're not unions. And if they do have the right to strike, they're detrimental to the public welfare as defined in the preamble to the Constitution. That's it. Gotcha. 
I understood that. Yeah. If a, a police union can uh, try to negotiate a new contract, just go on strike, you yeah. know, who's going to make the call to... Uh, you know? Yeah, I, I don't think they should be... Con- the, um they should be negotiating with my tax dollars. It's just me. <laughs> to his point, private sector, it, it doesn't matter, right? Public right. sector, it's ridiculous, in my opinion. Yeah, agreed. There. Thanks for uh, breaking that down for me, uh, Alan. Just, I appreciate just, that. Just for, just for a, a sideline on the union part, uh, Nissan built a huge factory down here in central Mississippi uh, a number of years ago. Um, the UAW, Mississippi, of course, is an open shop state. Uh, the UAW has tried several times to unionize that plant, never even got close. Yeah, these, those foreign uh, car makers don't, I, I don't think, uh, unionize. I, I know that the, uh, you know, the American, uh, obviously the UAW, they, they unionize and the other ones do not, which is probably why they yeah. are, they're not as bankrupt. <laughs> but um, so I, I wanted to get a take on something real quick. Um, I can read the article if you want to. Yeah, that. go ahead. Go ahead. All right. So there's an article in the AP. Uh, the illegal tunnels under New York City synagogue destabilized nearby buildings, officials say. Um, uh, the illegal tunnel discovered under an historic Brooklyn synagogue com- compromised the stability of a, a several structures surrounding the religious complex, prompting an order to vacate as well as citations against its owner, city officials said. Inspectors with New York City uh, City's Building Safety Agency uncovered a tunnel that was 60 feet long, 8 feet wide beneath the Shabbat Lubitsch Global Headquarters. Shabbat Lubitsch. Yeah. Lubitsch uh, Global Headquarters in Crown Heights. Uh, it connected four buildings owned by the Hasidic group through openings cut into basement walls there. Uh, yeah, so not much information is really in. You saw the video. You saw the mattresses, right? You saw the baby strollers, a bunch of other items. Um, again, this went pretty viral the first day. Alan, uh, we don't have that much information on it yet, though, except for what we saw in the videos and what the uh, emergency... Um, texts that the uh, Bob Luvovich put out there in response to it. But what is your take, real quick? We don't have to spend much time on it. What's your opinion on those tunnels? I, I did just uh, a brief brief review of it this morning because and I, I generally, other than things that affect national security, I don't really pay much attention to that. In large part because since uh, almost all of the mainstream media is Jewish-owned, and there's a few that isn't, if there's anything really embarrassing or detrimental there, we'll never see it. I'll never know it. <laughs> yeah, that's just a reality. Um, what I found really intriguing is that the the Hasidic Jews, the Orthodox Jews, are generally generally have had two characteristics. One of which I knew, and one of which I didn't. And I mean, understand that this this is it's not quite a cult, but it's 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 close to a to a branch Davidian as you're going to get within within Orthodox Judaism. Uh, and I don't think that works to its favor, but nonetheless, that's 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 a different issue. One of the things that that Orthodox Jews generally, and I'm going to say generally because nothing is 100% anything. I don't care where it is. Uh, they're not Zionists. Most of the Orthodox Jews are not Zionists, and I don't know why. Whether it's because of of uh, theological reasons or because they think the Messiah is yet to come and without that there shouldn't be an Israel or couldn't be an Israel, I really don't know. But the other one is that they're Talmudic Jews. That I didn't know until this morning. And I didn't know, because you know I am not a theologian, please, um, that there are two traditions of Torah, which is generally put up as the equivalent of the Old Testament in the Bible. Um, one is the written tradition, the other is the oral tradition, and the oral tradition is like closer to the Talmud, and it's not one of the, the written books in the Old Testament that we would see or in Torah that we would see. So a lot of the, the nastiness in the Talmud, as reflected perhaps, and I say this because I'm not really well versed on the oral tradition of the Torah, but the Talmud, I've read about, I guess, something between a quarter and a third of it over the years. I I can't read a lot of it at one sitting. Uh, It's uh, 
something between nauseating and disgusting. It's in that that, that line at it. Yeah, and it's it's old. It was it was I, I when I first read it, I thought you know, this is some cult, on the fringe, on the fringe of Judaism, as just out there. I didn't realize until I actually started reading it that this was written over a period of about 300 years from 2nd, 3rd century A.D. to 5th, 6th century A.D., somewhere in that. That's exactly, 5th, 6th is what okay. I heard. Yeah. They, you know, it, it varies a little kind of when you're cutting this. But it includes people and sayings by people like Rabbi Hillel. And you notice that the Jewish student centers on our campuses, if they have them, are the Hillel centers. So if this yep. guy is held in high esteem within Judaism. Uh, and he is in, in company with an awful lot of people who are really nasty, really nasty. And reading some of the Talmud is, is not a joy. And if this particular cult of Orthodox Judaism, and that's what I call Shabbat, that may have something closed up at my door for that one. Uh, but if this particular cult is a Talmudic cult, then I think there's really not any limit to to the unpleasantness of which they would be capable against non-Jews, because that that is essentially the theme of that part of the Talmud, that quarter to a third of the Talmud that I've read. You know that there are some very strict rules on what Jews can do to Jews, to other Jews. Very strict rules. They're very strict barriers. I mean, this but is. But there is pretty much open. Um, basically open season on non-Jews, correct? That's correct. And it, and it doesn't matter whether they're Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists. If you're not a Jew, you're prey. That's it. That, that is it, yeah. So real quick, uh, Alan, well, I want to get into something else here. Well, well, can I ask a question? Go ahead. Uh, either you gentlemen, uh, for the listening viewing audience, maybe we'll see this because we do want to educate people, break things down. Um, what is Zionism exactly? When you say Zionist Jews, what, what, what are we talking about? What the word Zionism? What's that mean? Jewish nationalism. They believe that Israel is the homeland, and they support the homeland for the Jewish people. It's an ethno. Does you support the ethno state of a, a Jewish state? Uh, okay. uh, you can elaborate on that, but is that basically it? I think that's basically it, but it's a little bit more than that. Um, it's not just simply having a Jewish state. It's actively moving against anyone or anything that might in the future threaten it. Uh, and it, it includes an awful lot of dual citizens. And I first became aware of this when I was invited by uh, a group of neighborhood to, to give a talk to one of their sessions in Memphis. And I said, what do you think about, about dual citizenship? And I said, well, it's a form of political bigamy. And it, there's always a priority in it. And in that priority, the, a dual citizen, whether born in Israel and adopting the citizenship of the United States, Sweden, Britain, doesn't matter, uh, or being born in one of those countries and adopt going to Israel and becoming an Israeli citizen as well, uh, the primary allegiance is always to Israel. There's not any question about that. And that doesn't matter for the political party. I mean, half of Biden's cabinet is Jewish. Most of them do a citizen. That's eighty percent. Half of 80%. Trump's. Half of Trump's. Yep. Was Jewish. Yep. Dual citizens. Most of them dual citizens. Yep. I mean, yep. there's no difference. They now, they now basically own both political parties. Yep. Not not a single prominent member of either party, including Trump, DeSantis, uh, Abbott in Texas, Christy Noem, uh, Nikki Haley, any of the Democrats. Not one will. I will criticize Israel for anything it's doing. I, I, I made a, uh, I will admit a sarcastic comment, not that Marine gunnery sergeants are ever sarcastic. I mean, you guys know that. You know, just, you know, just oh, come on, Matt. No, don't look at me like that. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm laughing. <laughs> Go ahead. You know, gunnies are all sweetness and light. You know, Scotty, you know that, right? Wasn't your gunnies sweetness and That's light? That's right, gunny. Too? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Thank you on that. But I said, <clears throat> excuse me that um, if, if evidence were produced, and this is a hypothetical for your audience, it is not happening as far as I know, uh, if, if evidence were produced 
that Jewish settlers in Israel were boiling Palestinian babies for breakfast. The entire Congress of the United States, with a few outliers, would pass a resolution saying that Israel has a right to feed itself. Yeah, I am <laughs> absolutely certain of that. <laughs> well, 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 let me. Um, I have one more question. One more. Go ahead. All right, and then you no, go, go ahead. You're good. <laughs> All right. So when you hear the, the term Zog, and you've worn shirts in here that has Zog on, yeah. What does Zog stand for? Zionist okay. occupied government. Okay. Yeah. And is that correct? Yes. Is the, yeah. is the and, government occupied by Zionists? I, the thing of it is, I don't see that in, or the equivalent of it, in other countries that are occupied. I mean, yeah. but, but then they're, they're, it's really interesting in Europe because they're going in a very different fashion. Uh, you know, they are very strongly influenced, if not controlled, by Jewish money and Jewish-dominated media. But the governments, look at the United Kingdom. And, and, and you, you have in the United Kingdom a Hindu prime minister. Mm. London has a Muslim mayor. Yeah. Yep. Scotland has a Muslim prime minister. Yeah. First yep. minister, sorry, first minister. Yeah. And Ireland has a homosexual Hindu as its prime minister. Isn't there a transgender something somewhere? Not of those, not of those four. Okay, maybe I'm thinking South America or something. Uh, possibly, <laughs> possibly somewhere else, but not there. Yeah. Not, not um, among those four. Just like, and the, the rest of the European countries seem to be competing, all of them concealing the Jewish influence in this. Yeah. And they're, all of them, as well as the American politicians, are in absolute denial of the Jewish role and pushing migration, and all of them are owned by Jewish money and know the influence of Jewish media. Yeah, so so let let me bring that up because one of your videos you did in 2018, you, and again in 2018 you had made a video saying that, you know the the, the Zionists have won the hearts and minds yep. Yep. of the American people. Now, as we see today, we see a lot of the mask off now. Yep. Okay. A, a lot of it has to do with like. I would say Kanye West maybe sparked it going on with Kyrie Irving talking about the the uh, uh, slave trade issue. But that basically, whenever Elon Musk took over X, he allowed a lot of people to speak freely that would normally be banned for just putting out factual mm -hmm. information, which we've seen tons sure, of. Sure, sure, sure. Now, that being said, people like Lucas Gage, who just got banned for three months, but they're putting out all of this factual mm -hmm. information. They're putting out videos yep. of, of rabbis in their own words, uh, uh, Israeli government officials in their own words, uh, documentation, that, that stuff like in the Talmud, stuff like that. You have seen a plethora of this now, and now more and more people are waking up to it. You see the mask off. More and more people are starting to understand the control of, of Zionist influence mm -hmm. in America. Now, that being said... Do you think that their power grip that they had back when you did that video in 2018, do you think they're sort of losing some of that power now? Do you see a shift in that control in the America, or do you see something could possibly happen in that uh, gr power grip that they have on American government, American media? Put it this way, discourse in general in America? No, no. I think I think the grip is strengthening, if anything else. And the reason, the reason they are... The mask has come off, and they are so blatant about it. I mean, every time someone breathes in the wrong direction, uh, Jonathan Greenblatt, the head of the ADL, comes out and, and bleats about white supremacism and racism, and that anything that contradicts them is, is very openly out there. I think the... Uh, I think the United States went, was at a, an irreversible fork in the road in 2020. We talked about uh, that. Right, yeah. We talked about that. And uh, I think that it, it needs to be understood that during, during the six months of rioting, you know, Donald Trump did nothing. He had a constitutional responsibility and the statutory authority and the position as commander in chief of the armed forces to suppress the riots bloodily suppress the riots. And that's what it would have taken. To arrest governors and mayors who would let that happen, but to sweep the house, lots of empty cells in, in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. They'll get a beautiful view of the beach. It's a nice place to be. Yeah. He did nothing. 
we the people did nothing. The election didn't matter. I mean, the election at that point was a foregone conclusion. They have simply, the, the Democrats and, I can't say that's the Jewish run Democrats because it's the Jewish run Republicans too. They have complete control of both houses of Congress. They have complete control of the media. Let me let me let and me stop you because I want you to matters. I want and, you to mention. No, let me, go ahead. Let me just pick up on this one yeah, more thing. Go ahead. And remember, you're talking to a gunny. <laughs> 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 um, there's something that there's something that happened in China uh, in the 1950s after the communists took over. It's called the Hundred Flowers Campaign. So let let a hundred flowers bloom, let a thousand thoughts contend. Uh, and the idea was that there could be more freedom of expression. Uh, I don't think that Musk is necessarily being an instrument of this, but what lifting this cover of censorship off formerly Twitter, now X has done, is that a lot of people who wanted to say things that were really critical of the powers that be, of the Jewish influence in the government, of the extent to which there's an, an anti-white racism being manifested and practiced by the government who are absolutely opposed to the transgender insanity, and it is insanity, who are absolutely opposed to the migrants being swarming into this country. We don't know how many, 8 million, 18 million, somewhere in that number. Can't keep count. They are now visible. And I'll bet you, and I'll bet you any amount of money that the FBI and the NSA among others, are taking down the names and building the dossiers on the people who are taking the opportunity to speak out. And the aftermath of it, aftermath of the 100 Flowers campaign in China, well, the thousand thoughts contended. And when it was over, they cut those flowers down. Yep. And that's what's going to be our future. No, they're, they're, I think they are, they are so public and so blatant because they are absolutely certain that they've won. And I'm afraid they might have. Um, and I don't say the, that easily because as a Marine, I don't like to think in those terms. But you right, know, no, uh, but, you know, reality if, if is reality. If you're if you're sitting in Corregidor and you're you're getting pounded down, you know, yeah, you know the Bataan death march is out there, but you know it happens. The Battle of Bataan. Yeah. So yeah. the f name. What is the lobby? Is the uh, the fifty. Organizations uh, of it's Jewish the pre of presidents of major Jewish organizations, and there's 50, correct? Yeah, uh, they're, they're, it varies slightly. It's it's the high 40s. Uh, I think 47, 48, 49. It varies a little bit from year to year. Okay. Uh, and there's also several associated organizations. Now right. that the conference APAC. includes the ADL, the Anti Defamation League. Mm -hmm. It includes APAC, the American the Israel Public Affairs Committee, which owns the Congress. These are just yep. two of nearly 50 organizations. Yeah. And that's and, just and the main all, there's, a, there's a lot of money, and they go to basically, like you said, not only United States senators, representatives, presidential candidates, they're going to state governors. Oh, yeah. No, no. State represent, you know, uh, General Assembly that, members. That, I'll tell you, back, in, back in, in 2011, I wrote a series of five articles for Veterans Today, and the last of one of those was, you know, repost against Zionism, take it to the people. And at that point, uh, virtually none of the state or major urban governments were under that control. There was no BSD legislation out there. There was no banning of it. But they had confined that to the federal government. And in the 12, 13 years since, they've got down to most of the state governments 37 states now have anti-BSD legislation. Uh, and, and BDS for everybody BDS, is boycott, yeah, BDS, disinvestment, yeah, and sanctions. Yeah. Um, real quick, we have to plug the Spreely Network, uh, Alan. So just give us like one minute. we got to plug the Spreely Network. Okay. This is the Burn Pit Podcast. You're watching us on Spreely TV or the Freedom Hub app. Spreely TV since the beginning of time. The spoken and written word has been the most effective weapon in the defense of personal liberty. Individual freedoms are a gift from God and secured by the right to defend them. This is a basic tenet in a free society. On Spreely, we embrace the notion we present our audience with content and hosts sharing a range of uh, opinions and ideals. We are united in our love for America and our support for the Constitution. Spreely TV is your source 
for some of the country's best thinkers and storytellers. Our team is dedicated to taking the news of the day, the learned lessons of history, and an eye on the future of America and turning it into the most thought-provoking and engaging programs available anywhere. Welcome to your home on Spreely TV. You can find Spreely on Roku, Apple TV, and Fire Stick. You can download the Freedom Hub app. Again, that's Freedom Hub. Go right into the App Store, type in Freedom Hub, download us for free, and you can watch us right from your smart device or uh, iPhone or Android, whatever it is uh, that you own, and you can watch us anytime, anywhere. A lot of good stuff up there. Yeah. All right. Well, why don't we get into the uh, presidential candidates and get Alan's uh, opinion on on that? So go ahead. Right. The Iowa caucuses are coming up, and what you're looking at is really only four remain. You have uh, former uh, President Donald Trump. You have Governor of Florida, uh, Ron DeSantis, former Governor of South Carolina, Nikki Haley, and uh, young uh, millionaire tech uh, uh, India guy uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. Uh, of those four. Uh, Dr. Alan Zabrowski, uh, do you like any of them? Or is there any qualities of the four that you like or stand out to you um, at all? Or does it even matter? <laughs> I, it, it really, I don't think it really matters. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, so many elections are so close. I, I've often thought that we could simplify matters by when the, the Democrats and the Republicans or the Republicans get down, just to flip coins and tear down to the final one and, and end it that way. Uh, regardless of what they say, what they're going to be able to do doesn't matter. Because the Congress, you know, the system of government was set up, as you guys know, uh, as a republic of, of sovereign states. And since 1865, and I'm a man from Michigan originally, I live in Mississippi, but I am a Yankee, born and bred. Actually, that's not really true. My family came here 20 years after the Civil War, so it didn't matter then. <laughs> but I mean, since 1865, you know, 1865 settled the question of the sovereign state, and they don't exist anymore, really, except for issuing driver's license and license plates. And nothing, nothing that a person who can be nominated by either party or elected in what passes for an election in this country can do is going to change that. Nothing can. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. I mean, you know. Whatever, whatever Trump was or is or was not, uh, it was pretty clear that he talked a very good talk and he actually did not walk the walk. Yeah. Uh, part of that was in 2020 when he just let the cities burn. And part of that was in 2017, 2018, when he could have taken 1% of the defense budget in accordance with the requirements of the president and the commander in chief and built a wall across the border that nothing living could have gotten through and built up the Coast Guard and the Gulf of Mexico and the, the Pacific Coast off California so nothing could go around it and put aircraft over it so if anyone tried to fly in, they could shoot them down. Yep. And he didn't do anything. No, he and, could have federalized the National Guard in every border yeah, state just, as well. Just didn't, just didn't do it. And yeah. you, you can't, I can't really say Biden. I mean, what is Biden? Biden is an incestuous, semi-senile pedophile. Yeah. Well, and what, and well, what I, are you going to get that? Whoever his handlers are, yeah. their track goes back to Tel Aviv. Uh, well, yeah. You know. Yeah, but the thing is, you see Americans today, and this is the problem because I don't know how to fix it, is people have, I, I guess, have been so conditioned psychologically that they really believe that voting is some sort of useful endeavor to restore freedom and liberty and constitutional rights or and this constitutional republic. And there is literally, in my opinion, at least post-Civil War, like you said, there's no evidence that even comes close to proving that yeah, well, to be the case. Today, today I think it's, it's, it's different in a couple of ways. You know, I, I, I'm very sure... That, that future archaeologists digging through the ruins of what was the United States of America are going to puzzle at how the most heavily armed civilian population in the world could have let this happen, not just to their country, but to their children, yeah. and, and done nothing, yeah. and done absolutely nothing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I may be wrong, I may be very wrong on this, but I would like to believe that if this had happened 60 years ago, I mean, it couldn't have happened with the, the political system, but if the same thing, 
you know, with the transgenders to the children, the gender modifications, all of this thing had happened. I would like to think that the adults of the day, the teenagers and adults of the day, would have taken their weapons off the walls and gone off and done some shooting. I, yeah. absolutely, I absolutely believe this. And that, that, would, be, I, I and that would be the end of it right now. I mean, you've got a heavily armed civilian population with a lot of bullets and no balls. Yep. I, I just wrote a little essay on my IG page yesterday, and it, I, I labeled it, the American's fear of death means the death of America. Yeah. And that means that no one wants to do anything because they're all afraid of mainly dying. Right? Everybody fears death and everybody fears imprisonment. Now, it's ironic because everybody dies, right? Every, all of us are dead, eventually. Um, you don't have that 1776 mentality. Even the, uh, you know, the Civil War, you know, also known as the Battle for Southern Independence. You, you had people like Sherman burning down cities. A lot of those guys joined the war or joined the Confederacy to just protect their homes and, and their territory from, from being scorched earth policy by Sherman. And you know, they were like, okay, it looks like we have to fight. Let, let's, let's, let's defend our, our, our property. And the fact that we have not had war on our own land, we've never had to fight since the Civil War. Not one time had we had to take up arms as a nation, as a people, and fight against any type of even invading army or civil war. You had a uh, domestic enemy. Okay, not only that, but we have basically conditioned ourselves, and I believe it is through that cultural Marxist ideology, right? I mean, and I urge everybody to, to read up and study cultural Marxism, but it weakens the society. You had the, we can go down the list, the feminist movement, LGBT movement, all this stuff, and people, like you said, they have guns, they watch movies like Braveheart, they watch movies like The Patriot, they watch all these movies where the good guy's fighting for freedom, yeah, yet they won't even speak about doing it. They're just like, gotta vote Republican. And, and if that's the case, I believe it's the cause of that case is for not having to deal with warfare and battle on our own soil in a very, very, very long time. And if I can quote Bane from the movie The Dark Knight Rises, um, he said, peace has cost you your strength. Victory has defeated you. Because we lived in peace for so long being victorious in all of these Zog Wars, we think we have freedom, and yet not one single war that we fought in the 20th century did we fight to protect any freedom in America. Because yeah. we've lost freedom decade after decade. World War II, did, they, did the National Firearms Act get banished? No. In World War I, did the Federal Reserve get banished? No. So what freedom was anybody fighting for in any of these wars? Yeah. And I know you're a veteran, and this is not, I'm not trying to, right, you know, sure. diminish what anybody did when, during ser service, but we didn't fight for freedom. Yeah. What's your take on that? Well, one of, one of the things that's, that's a little bit interesting is that um, it's not just a judgmental thing. I think you're right that everyone is afraid of dying, and I don't think anyone, I, I, I didn't know anyone in the seventh marine, she said, I want to go out and die for America today. No, you wanted to kill the other guy. <laughs> you know, that was the end of it. Not a question of dying yourself. I mean, you understood that it could happen, but there wasn't any sense of enthusiasm. There are very few people. Scotty, you might you might have known someone in the Corps who felt differently, but I don't I don't think I've ever known or heard of anyone in any of the services who really look forward to the idea of dying. You, know, you might take a deep breath and say you could do it. But there's been something else happening on the side, not just the education system, what's laughingly called our education system, not just the, the uh, re-socialization, the indoctrination of three generations, three to four generations now, initially very subtly, very subtle and slow in the 60s and 70s, but increasing over the decades and you know, getting more heavy handed. I have read several several medical articles 
indicating that for white males and white males only globally, there, is, there has been a 50% plus drop in testosterone over the last 20 to 30 years. 50%. And only white males. Now, that's if you want to talk about a targeted bioweapon, that's what's happening. If that's true. If, if that's true. I have to look into that. I, I I've have, heard that as well. I have seen it in several publications that I okay. think are, are <clears throat> responsible. Uh, so the more steroids a, not, being a for everybody. Doc, not being a medical doctor, I won't say that, but uh, several that do. But it would account for the remarkable passivity, because that's just not a matter of reproduction. That affects everything. You know, musculature, aggressiveness, combativeness. We're hard, we were a rough, rougher people in the earlier days. There were times and places where they tested weapons, nuclear, like the first test of, the nuclear, of nuclear weapons, and didn't worry about what the fallout was. But first of all, they didn't know much about it, and secondly, they didn't care. They were going to test a weapon, and they were going to use it. Uh, we become a softer people. It's a softer culture. You know, I don't think that there's any question about that. And the, the, the really sad thing, and this again is a paraphrase, I, I wish I had thought of it. Uh, a friend of mine wrote that, you know, if the people who love this country had fought half as hard for it as the people who are trying to destroy it, this would have been over a decade ago. And I agree with Scotty, what do you think? And that's the bottom line. The Second Amendment... And the tools of the Second Amendment have become nothing more or less than stage props. Yep, yep. I agree. I go, well, I mean, uh, I, I've seen a, a study. We just talked to, uh, with Travis Neville on that. It's in his book yeah. uh, about even grip strength. I don't know if you've seen that study, yep. Dr. Uh, Alan grip strength. The, the that. grip strength, they, the, what they did is they went to a college about 30 years ago, and they tested the grip strength of just your average, everyday, 18, 19, 20, 21-year-old college student. They went back to the same college. It's not like they... Hey, this uh, test group's going to be construction workers, and this test right. group's going to yeah, be same place. You know, it, it's right, same place, same uh, age group, and, and the uh, the grip strength of the average male had dropped by like fifty, forty percent, something yeah. like that. Yeah, like, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I, you, know, and, just, and, you know, sometimes this so what they call empirical reality, which means that what what you see does what you see match what you believe. Um, yeah. I took a shuttle bus from the Detroit Airport through Ann Arbor to Lansing, Michigan last last May after I saw you guys. You up there. Scotty, you of course were, were hanging out somewhere else, but not, that's all right. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that as, as Marines always discuss these things. On the other hand, you look you look stronger than I do now, plus I'm 82 years old, so I think I'll I'll let Matt stand in for you me. You look great for 82. Wow, <laughs> you look great. Okay, wait, wait, but, sharper than the guy sitting in the Oval Office. Well, yeah, well, we, we, drove, we drove in that bus through Ann Arbor, through the, right through the University of Michigan campus. And I looked out there, and there were lots of, lots of students around, you know? And I, what struck me was how effeminate so many of the males looked and how masculine so many of the females looked. The, and when I say masculine, I don't mean that the, the women looked like men. It's that they were healthier. On an average, looking at them, they looked healthier, they looked stronger, they looked more fit. Not all of them. And the men weren't all that that effeminate. Not all of them were. What do you think the, the culprit uh, what do you think the culprit of that is? If you got a fifty percent drop in te- in testosterone and I would I would guess that's a good part of it. And also a, a denigration of physical fitness and exercise. You know, physical fitness is racism, don't you know? Fitness, no, I'm sorry. Physical, <laughs> yeah. fit, physical fitness and going to the gym is essentially fat, white supremacy. fat people. It's fat phobic. You're yeah, fat phobic. Fat phobic. Fat phobic. Thank you. <laughs> That's ridiculous. I miss, I miss all the phobias out there. There's just so many of them these days. Yeah. You know, right. Well, if you I, wake up, what are you, a sleep phobic? You know, can you do it? Right. I, I believe that. Um, we have been fed uh, um, a, a diet over the past 70, 80 years. We've been fed a diet of obeying the government no matter what. Um, they're the ones in charge, but you guys get food to pick. Food is shit. What's that? Our food is shit, too. Yeah, food is garbage. But we, you get to pick who can lead you. 
And who can be in charge of these institutions, even though it's always the same? You basically are given a choice between two pieces of garbage, which doesn't matter, even if they're good people. They really don't make decisions. I've said this a million times. No matter who's in office, they're, they're just there as a puppet. Again, Biden is not running anything. Trump should have done all these things. He didn't do any of it. He didn't even speak about doing it. I mean, I'm not saying he's smart because, in my opinion, Trump's an idiot. But he, at least he's like, okay, BLM's burning down the country. I'm the president. I'm going to do something. He didn't even speak about doing anything. Mm -hmm. So he's being, they're all being told what they can and can't do. Which, again, Alan, because I, I, we have only a couple minutes left here. So. You can do the word association game if you want. Okay, but real quick, mm -hmm. I want to get Alan's take. Alan, you are given the microphone to speak to the whole country right now. I want you to tell everybody, this is your Hail Mary attempt Tell America, especially the ones who consider themselves patriots, tell them what to do in order to gain back their freedom and to restore the Constitutional Republic and defeat Zog. <laughs> Go ahead. Very simply, reread the, re -read the Declaration of Independence and act on it. Because nothing the royal officers were charged with doing in the Declaration of Independence is half as bad is what our government is doing to us today. Anything and everything included in the Declaration of Independence is true, much more so than the Constitution. Uh, and the, what, the, what the Declaration of Independence said we should do is what we should do. It's that. Read it, remember it, act on it. And recognize that in, in the Civil War, in, the first civil war was our revolution, and it was a That's civil correct. war. That's correct. Loyalists first versus those opposed to it. That's right. The second civil war, the second civil war was 1861-65. That was an and, independence war. You know, and, and whatever and whatever one thought, thought about slavery, constitutionally the South was correct, because if you'd got to the Constitutional Convention in 1787 and yeah. said that sovereign states that voluntarily joined a union couldn't leave it, you wouldn't have had a yeah. constitution. It wasn't about slavery. And, Five United States owned it was, slaves. It was, it was an issue, but it wasn't the issue. No. Uh, well, they even I offered think, them the Corwin Amendment. If there's going to be a third civil war, call it a second revolution, it's going to be even worse than the second. It's going to be so much worse. It's going to be so much worse. Yeah. And, I th and I think we'll lose that. Yeah. Well, I'm the Declaration afraid, of I'm afraid we'll lose that. I don't like it. But if I, I, I look out there... And there is no quick fix for 60 to 80 years of ruin that has been force-fed into us. There is absolutely no. no quick fix. Well, Alan, at least we're not speaking German. Uh, <laughs> well, let's do the uh, word association, though. All right. Since uh, we're arguing to the Iowa caucuses and we're, we do talk about uh, uh, polls and politics and whatnot, uh, let's start with uh, some politicians. What we're going to do, Alan, is a word association game. I'm going to, <laughs> I, I'm going to say let, a let, name. Let me, let me call my attorney quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to say a name. Now, it could be the first thing that pops in your head. It doesn't have to be one word. Maddie sometimes just goes on on rants, which is fantastic. So I, I'm just going to say a name of a current politician, and you just let me know the first thing that comes into your head. All right. You guys ready? Go ahead. All right. Bernie Sanders. Go ahead, Alan. Bernie, Bernie Sanders. What's the thing come? Slippery. Matter? Oh. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Just, like, he's an admitted communist, so at least you have that. At least he admits it. All right. This gentleman okay. just dropped out of the race. His name's Chris Christie, former governor of New Jersey. Waity. Ham sandwich. <laughs> Go ahead. Don't insult ham sandwiches. <laughs> All right, this, this gentleman, this gentleman also dropped out of the race, but he was once Trump's uh, former vice president, and that is Mike Pence. Go ahead, Alan. Um, crooked. Uh, I just a lo loser. All right, she's still in the race. She's the former governor of South Carolina. She's getting a ton of money from Wall Street. Her name's Nikki Haley. Um, or, or. yeah. Uh, yeah, Israeli whore. Okay. That's, that's uh, more precise, yes. 
Yeah. <laughs> All right. He's the uh, governor of uh, Florida. His name is Ron DeSantis. Go ahead. Governor who? Ron no, DeSantis. Ron DeSantis. Um, Zionist. Yeah. Uh, criminal traitor uh, signing anti-constitutional laws until he goes over to Israel to sign anti-constitutional legislation, which is pretty pathetic. Uh, has red flag that, law, uh, gun laws in his states. Um, is, that what's one, that? is that one long word that I just never heard before? Oh, yeah, he did a couple months ago. No, he went no, to Israel I, I said, to sign. Where, where, you were saying just one long word. One word. What? Oh, yeah, what? no, I, I go off on rants sometimes. Okay, okay. Again, he, he's actually a criminal by definition, uh, but most of them are anyway. But he's really bad. I, be, I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a sitting governor, and he's violated the Constitution. He's deprived constitutional rights, and he's uh, violated multiple uh, constitutional amendments, including uh, second, 14th, first, uh, fourth, uh, I can probably go on. Go ahead. Next. The governor of California, Gavin Newsom, he's made some uh, headlines uh, recently, been de- uh, debated. Ron DeSantis went over to China. Um, what do you think about uh, Gavin Newsom, sir? Sewage. <laughs> yeah. Um, man, I don't even know. A Marxist. That's it. Okay. All right. How about uh, the current uh, sitting vice president, uh, Kamala Harris? <laughs> <laughs> that was my answer. Okay. <laughs> I just, I just, I, I, just I, I, have, I, I just don't care I about any of them. Like her. No, I, I just don't care about any of these people. I don't just uh, they're right, useless. We'll, we'll do the last one. Last one yeah. we'll do uh, is RFK. RFK, go ahead, Alan. Disappointing. Yeah, he's. Um, yeah, I, I wish he would uh, come out and publicly say who who actually did kill his uh, uncle and his father. Who did? But he. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, to Alan's point, he said before the he's talked about the Declaration of Independence, and it's funny because no one ever brings that up. That's a document that no one ever really brings up on the right. They always talk about the Constitution, even though they don't really care about it because they violate it or support the violation of it. The Declaration of Independence literally tells the people they have the right to abolish their government, which means to exterminate, to eradicate, to disintegrate, to wipe out. I mean, I can go on forever with the uh, um, synonyms for that word. It literally tells the people they have the right to overthrow their government if it becomes too tyrannical. It literally says that in there. Second paragraph. If it, if it, become, if it becomes abusive of those rights. Yes, right. which it has. Well, uh, today, folks, uh, thank you for joining us again. Here we are every Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, 1 o'clock Pacific. Our guest today was Dr. Alan Zabrowski. Uh, what a pleasure and a joy it was to sit here and talk with you. We had some good laughs and, and uh, learned some, some things today. Uh, and I guess, guys. I guess none of us should expect uh, an offer of a political appointment from Nikki Haley. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, nope. Uh, do, uh, Dr. Alan Zbrowski, uh, you, anytime you would like to join us uh, on Mondays, you just reach out to one of us, let us know, and you're always welcome, sir. Uh, thank you uh, again for everything, and we'll l- let you have uh, one last parting word, and then we'll just say goodbye. I hope, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong about America and about the United States. Um, I spent my life serving this country in the Marines and afterwards, and I'm appalled at this current condition, and I'm hoping wrong. All right. Well, thanks again, everybody, for watching. Thanks, uh, Dr. Allen's boss, Maddie. Love you, buddy. Love you too, man. I'll see you next Monday. All right, if we're still alive. (laughs) We're out of here. See ya. Thank you for taking the time to watch us. If you like this episode and you'd like to watch another one, click here. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks.